I suppose, obviously, playing at the elite, the top level now, um, you, you've come up against, obviously, some of the world's best players and things. And is that something that you can see within them other sort of players? And, and that's what takes them to that next level. It, it, obviously, they've got all the ability in the world, but it is the determination and, and passion and, and their attitude towards what they're doing. Yeah, the top, top players, you can see they're all like, naturally gifted as well. Um, just in like, a physique presence. You know, they, yeah. they're a different different animal, even compared to myself. Um, mm -hmm. You see, I wasn't really that much bigger than anybody else when I was a kid. Yeah. You know, seeing the, yeah. see the shorts I was wearing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, even from that respect, they were, they were gifted to a certain level. But mm -hmm. to get to like the, like the Champions League level, you know, it's yeah. a different sort of animal. But, but like I said, their stories are, are quite similar. You see the, the Jesus story from when he was mm -hmm. sweeping streets and... Look at Ronaldo, yeah. what he was doing. Yeah, he's, yeah. he was gardening with his, with his dad in, at the start, and yeah, you know, he's he's probably a perfect example. Um, I'm sure if you could have got him on this on his Zoom call, you would have done because he's a more much better example than I am. But yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. It just shows what it takes to to reach yeah. a, not a no, high standard, a, but the, the top standard. Yeah, that's good. And, and something I always remember about you, mate, and I think that's obviously studying, but you were you were very level headed as well. You were you were you weren't sort of taken away by anything you're always sort of a real nice approachable lad and stuff as well and I think like that that common courtesy and stuff it goes a long way not just in football but in life and I'll, I'll start off why I went away um have you seen um any other young players who could have made a professional uh, but due to their mindset didn't make it um I've seen a lot of young players like I said before like a lot more gifted in ability wise than what I was um but yeah, I think I think the way I've always seen it is just be like an information sponge. Um, whereas I wasn't as gifted as many of my teammates at that age, so they were on that a, more of a pedestal in terms of they thought they'd made more of what they were than what I was at the time. You know, they thought there was a better standard. So I just tried to use that as my advantage. Um, listen and learn every single day from coaches, from influences even outside of football, um, and just try and close that gap as much as possible. Well, yeah, just Quinn. on that point, you said about um, absorbing lots of information from different people that you've worked with. Um, have you come across the time when you've sort of worked with different coaches that you perhaps didn't like or didn't always agree with? What sort of attitude did you take towards working with those sorts of people? Um, how did you find that? Yeah, there's, there's been coaches and, and managers that we've not really got on. But I've, I've probably took an approach like a, more of an open-minded approach where he thinks like I've got a belief in what I think's right it doesn't necessarily mean my belief's right I think if I looked at what say a coach that I didn't agree with you know I'd, I'd be open enough to, to realize he might be just as right as what I am but just have different beliefs in the way we do things um, so like I say I would take on what he was saying um, analyze it and if it could make me better then then it's it's a good thing for me and him because eventually I'll be playing underneath him. He picks a team. Um, so if I can get a bit of information from him and make me a better player, then it's, it's, it's all good all around. Do you have any psychological training or psycho training um, to help deal with yeah. stress um, and anxiety? We do now. We never used to back, back at Berry yeah. and at Oldham. Um, I think, obviously, with the level you play, it improves. I think we've just took on two more psychologists just to help with the whole uh, COVID-19 thing, um, everyone being at home, etc. But yeah, I think I've been quite a believer of it. You know, I read quite a few books on it, as you can see. Um, it's something I do in my spare time. And I think it's helped me. Because um, you get setbacks, you get injuries, you get loss of form. The manager doesn't, you know, fancy at a certain point in a, in a season. Um, but like I said, like Lenny said, it's about, you know, having the character of being level-headed uh, no matter what being thrown at you, as long as you can digest it um, and not let it affect your attitude, performance, you know, and how you train, um, then yeah, it can it can hold you in good stead. Do school and football at the same time. Okay. Um, well, when you're a YouTuber, I think it's I think you have to do the like, the education side. I think it's good because I'm obviously coming towards like the later end of my career, um, and I've sort of uh, invested in like self improvement rather than like, obviously I haven't got the time to go to a university, etc. 
So I think it's, it's, it's finding a line, but I think it's very important. Just for what I was saying earlier on, with when you're dealing with people, um, it's just important you understand you can converse and you understand what each other needs from you. Um, I think the higher level of education or self-education you can have, you know, it helps in conversating with staff, coaches, fans, uh, players on the pitch. You know, the better you can get at that, um, you know, the end result if whatever line of work, football, business, um, it can only only be bored well for you know for having them good relationships and, and producing what you need. The question was, how do you stay motivated on the off season? Uh, it's quite difficult actually. Um, I think when you play a full season, it's about ten months in total, including pre season. You know, I think it's nice to to go away for two, maybe three weeks, and and do you know bare minimum um, right recovery jogs, etc. Uh, but I always get excited, even in within the first two or three weeks. I'm excited about pre-season already. You know, I think two or three weeks is enough rest for me mentally. I, people might be different. Um, but yeah, I, because I'm so passionate and want to get better every year, um, I look forward to coming back to pre-season. You know, it's even though it's the hardest time of the season, um, when you lose a bit of fitness, you've got to get it back up to the level you were at. Um, but yeah, I think it's just having that drive of, of wanting to improve every year then you welcome the challenge when the out season's finished and you're starting afresh and you just want to build on what you've done last season just to get more out of yourself and become better. I suppose one that links into that, Dale, is how have you, obviously this unprecedented time we find ourselves in, how have you found yourself sort of keeping motivated to trim from home and do bits again? Is, is that all like down to your own attitude? And I suppose teammates or other players, do you find that, they've found this situation harder and they, they haven't perhaps been as motivated at times? Yeah, well, what's been difficult with this, obviously this time, um, you, we actually don't know if the season's going to restart. So at the moment, it's all right when you can see like an end goal. Yeah. But at the moment, we're almost just ticking over just like in case. So you don't really know what you need to be doing. Mm. But we've been quite lucky because we have like, we have Zoom classes. So we'll mm. have like the same setup and everyone will be doing weights in the back. Or like a bike machine, just yeah. to make sure you're in like a, a, a physical state where if you are to come back, then you're at a, a decent standard of fitness. But yeah, it has been has been difficult. It's been different. It was nice for the first two three weeks. Mm. You know, it's a different environment. You, you're training differently. Um, but yeah, I'd like to get back at some point. Afternoon. Um, I would just like to ask. Um, do you have um any like tips for like teenagers that like want to become like a pro like do you like have tips like for them like who are in academies like if you go yeah to be fair yeah to be fair I wasn't in an academy until I was 16 um my story is actually very very lucky I was actually building a building site um from 15 I did it as part of my education at school um I was playing Sunday league like just general Sunday league like a lot of a lot of kids play uh nowadays and my son, the league manager, wrote a letter to uh, Berry to ask for a trial. Uh, now, there's 20, 24 trialists, and there's only one 90 minutes you can play. So, actually, a trial match. So, there's 24 trialists. Um, two of us got asked back for initial six weeks trial. So, that was the first hurdle. And then, after the six week trial, you get, I got, well, luckily, I got given a two year scholarship. So, I was literally. I was obviously had a one in 24 chance of even getting a trial. So you know how difficult it is. But I always thought, even from being a kid, um, you know, the questions like you get asked at school, what do you want to be when you're older? Um, it was always footballer, I want to be a footballer. I wasn't even in an academy, but I still believed that I wanted to be a footballer. You know, a lot of, I had a friend who was at Man United for years and years. I think he went there from eight till about 19, 20. And I just saw him as a, as a target, you know, and I did what I could. even. And being a teenager, just to try and get that gap closer between me and him, and he, he was from the same town as me, um, so I felt because he was here, I had to do more and more and more, uh, whether it be work, um, training, self training, or even Sunday league games and training. You know, you only train a couple of times a week, but I felt like I needed to do extra. And like I said, that's probably been the biggest key, um, probably not tip, but biggest key for me going. And obviously playing at a decent standard. Um, but on the theme of resilience, have you suffered any like, setbacks personally? It could be injury, 
um, I don't know, doubt from a manager or a coach? And what kind of things did you do to help overcome those? Yeah, I had a huge setback. I signed at Brighton in the January transfer window of 2014. And we were going for the playoffs. And just before the playoff game, um, I got tackled from like, the inside, did my ankle ligaments. Um, but I also like, contracted a CRPS, it's called. It's like a nerve condition. So like I said before, but when you have a target, you can almost work towards that target. But with my injury, because it was like affecting my nerves, like the brains, uh, the nurses are running from my brain. It was getting like dysfunctioned when it got to my ankle. So any training or any like rehab I did, it would just like blow up and become red. And it was supposed yeah. to be like a three month injury and it ended up being 10. Uh, so I just moved from London to Brighton. Um, and obviously Norvis don't really travel as much as you know. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it was difficult because I come to a new club. We were doing so well, I was playing. We made the playoffs and then I got a setback. Um, initially, thought it would only be three months and then obviously it turned out to be 10. But along them three months, four months, five months, it could have took six months, I could have been back for it. It could have took eight, it could have took nine. It took 10, but I wasn't to know. Yeah. So what was I did? All I did for myself was just work for that day, just get as much out of that day as I could. Um, and then obviously it just accumulated it could have been in, in theory if I didn't do as much work as I did it could have been 12, 14, 15 months um, yeah. but yeah I just tried to just do it single mindedly it was difficult very difficult I remember seeing a psychologist about that to be honest um, and she helped me along the way she just said do what you can because I mm. I was getting told things from the physio um, what wasn't working, but it wasn't the physio's fault. It was actually the nerve condition. Mm. So I was getting like built up frustration, um, being down, motivation was, was lacking. Um, but yeah, I just tried to just to single it out, work one day at a time, and then it just accumulated, it just compounded. And then it, I ended up being back fit after 10 months and, and touch wood, my ankle has been, has been good ever since. To confidence really, um, talking about playing at home and away, what what do you like about playing at the Amex? And then, um, what do you like at playing about somewhere like Anfield or Old Trafford? And, and which do you prefer? I actually enjoy playing away from home more. Um, I think I just get a better feeling when I hear the, the away crowd groaning because things are not going their way. Um, you know, it's all well and good being at the Amex and you've got the cheers and all the rest of it. But I think I, I play better and probably more from a psychological point of view, if we're going to a big club um, and you hear an Anfield or an Old Trafford jeering, booing the team, and it's obviously because of your performance, I just think that probably motivates me better than just, just fans like cheering, you know, yeah. you're doing well. It could be other teammates doing well at home. Um, but also on the flip side, if you're not playing so well at home and the crowd's getting on your back, you can't really hear that away from home. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the motivator to quieten an Anfield or an Old Trafford is... It's probably better pa for me. Palace has got to be a good one, isn't it? It's quite lively, yeah. yeah. Um, I enjoy going there. Millwall's tough. Yeah. That's yeah, not an easy that. place to go. But another one just linked to um, uh, leadership and the characteristics of good leaders. Who, who would you say you've enjoyed either playing under from a management point of view or from a captain point of view? And what made them such a good leader? Uh, captain's quite easy. Um, obviously you've got Bruno I'm not sure maybe if the bold fellow yeah, with a yeah. massive beard him um, and Gordon Greer both captains at Brighton and what they would do um, they would put their relationship with management um, staff chairman like people in between chief executives and stuff they would put their relationship not at risk but at like risk of a bit of adversity because they'd have the changing rooms um, back so much so any problems we had, we would go to the captain. Um, and if it's obviously, if it's, it's a team opinion, then they would just go to the, the manager first and foremost. And if they don't get any word from the manager, they would go straight to like chief exec or even the chairman, mm -hmm. they'd call the chairman. Um, and I think if you've got that sort of person within, within the dressing room, and luckily if I, I've had like, a couple in the last few years, um, yeah, it shows real leadership. They're not scared of affecting their personal relationship for the sake of the team and what the team wants. And I think that's massively important. Mm.